today on Beyond Six Seconds. There are so many incredible street artists, especially ones who are doing things that require being cloaked in anonymity because they're doing something that's illegal. And I thought, why not take all of my traditional training and the way that I talk about art that's already canonized and apply that to art that's new and make art accessible for those who are already enthusiasts. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's podcast, I'm speaking with Lizzie Dastin. Lizzie is the owner and founder of Art and Seeking, a platform that bridges the gap between the mainstream art world to the unorthodox world of street art. She also hosts a podcast for art enthusiasts, and she's writing a book on street art that will be out later this fall. Lizzie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to have you here. So how did you get the inspiration to start Art and Seeking? It actually came from probably the lowest I have ever felt about myself. So um, an interesting origin story, but I was in a PhD program and I had just gotten a master's at Christie's, the auction house, and I had the best experience there ever. And I was assuming that my PhD program was just going to be more of that. Mm -hmm. And I was very wrong. And I think that the traditional world of academia can be incredibly nourishing for a lot of people, but it just wasn't the right fit for me. And the advisor that I chose, she's a feminist historian and I'm a feminist. And that is really the lens through which I see the world and especially how I want to show up as an art historian. So I thought that it was the best fit. And unfortunately, she seemed to come from that generation of women who like to see or tend to see other women as competition. Mm. And it was a really destructive relationship. And going back even further... And this, of course, will circle back to your question, but Mm. my whole life, I was anxious that I'm not smart enough to do things. Mm. And I figured, well, if I have my doctorate, nobody is going to question whether I'm smart. So that was not the best reason to enter into this eight-year experience. Mm. And unfortunately, the advisor that I chose, she reflected back all of these anxieties and gave me more. And I remember there was one big test that I was studying for my oral exam. And she called me the night before and I thought that it was going to be this pep talk. And she said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that you're only so far in this program because you have a good personality. Oh, geez. And at that moment, I just mm-hmm. felt like I was completely worthless mm. and not good enough for this school and not good enough for this field. And I think once you get into that toxic spiral, it's just really hard to dig yourself out of. And I became increasingly unhappy and I just stuck with it because of all of this pressure that I had applied to myself. And because once you've invested so many years, why not just invest more? And anyway, it ended up being a choice between my mental health and my PhD. And I ended up dropping out, which was the best decision I have ever made for myself. And from that place came the terror because I've always wanted to be a professor. I've been teaching college since I was 22. And how can I sustain a life in this field that I love without a doctorate? So I'm from LA and I did the most LA thing imaginable. And I saw a life coach (laughs) and it was actually really helpful because she helped me come up with the micro of what my dream job would look like. And I was always so fixated on the macro. And she asked me questions like, what time do you wake up? What kind of outfit do you wear? How do you get to work? And through tiny questions like those and through teasing out my answers, I figured out that my dream job was something that I needed to build, something that didn't exist, but it was such an opportunity for me to create. And that is where Art and Seeking was born And it combines all of my greatest loves and assets. I get to walk around a lot, explore cities, discover things, sleuth, kind of like an urban anthropologist. I get to meet artists, discover new disruptive work. And most importantly, I get to communicate. 
And really, I see it as an extension of my teaching. And rather than doing it in the classroom, now I do it for a much broader audience. Wow. It's amazing how you can go from a very low point and challenging point in your life and really come out of it with help and assistance from your life coach and figure out the new direction that you want to take. Thank you. Now, I know much of your art history background is in sort of mainstream art. So I'm curious about why street art, sort of where your interest came from, and how did you get closer to that world? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I am the most traditional, bougie person ever. So for me, (laughs) who worked at the Metropolitan Museum, I worked at the Whitney Museum, went to Christie's. This is like the precious of the precious. (laughs) And to get from that to teaching this heterodox, cool, sexy, subversive, illegal art, really, it was an interesting road. And it all started randomly enough when I was teaching spin and I walked out of my class and I saw randomly this drain pipe on the side of the street And it was filled with all of these little geodes, you know, like when you crack open a geode and there are those crystallized forms inside. Yeah. And at first, that's what I thought that it was, that it was some kind of weird toxic growth. (laughs) And then I looked a little bit closer and I saw that the geodes were made from paper and there was no signature. There was no massive sign, massive scaling, massive polychroming. It was just this delicate little tender surprise And I researched about this work. I was fascinated and discovered that it was a piece of installation street art by a woman named Paige Smith. And I happened to be teaching contemporary art that day and public practice. So randomly, I just added it into the lecture. And I was teaching at Chapman University at the time. And this is the almost the end of the semester. And so I've been with these kids for months and months. And I saw that day when I started to teach them about art in the public space, an activation that really I hadn't seen before. And that got me to think that really there's something magical about art that is not confined by a frame, not confined on a wall, but art that lives, that breathes, that is a part of your routine. And it was a part of my routine that day coming out of that spin class. And I didn't have to carve out an entire day to go to the Getty. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to pre-plan. I just had to walk outside and be present. And I think that presence and that mindfulness is true about street art more so than it is about art in a traditional space. And so that's really what attracted me. And then the other part of that is that there are so many incredible street artists especially ones who are doing things that require being cloaked in anonymity because they're doing something that's illegal. And I thought, why not take all of my traditional training and the way that I talk about art that's already canonized and apply that to art that's new? And I thought that I could carve out a niche for myself in that way and legitimize or further legitimize art that's happening on the street and make art accessible for those who are already enthusiasts. Yeah. I mean, that totally makes sense. And, you know, a lot of us see street art if we're out and about, but for me, I I don't often stop to think of the artists behind it and the whole story of what it means and why it was placed there and how they chose to create that art. So I think it's really interesting to go into that world and help make it more accessible for people who, who see it so they can have a more of an appreciation for it. Yeah, thank you. And you got it exactly right. We see it, but we know nothing about it. And so many people, especially in this age of social media and selfie and self-obsession, we see art as a backdrop for our photos. Mm -hmm. And I saw that that was also an opportunity to explain how this kind of art is really such a sincere and profound part of activism. Because a lot of these artists, especially the ones doing things illegally, they are potentially sacrificing their freedom for a message. And I can't remember the last time I loved something or believed in something that much. And I just have the utmost respect for that kind of authenticity and that kind of drive and belief and integrity. And I want to do whatever it is that I can to bring this type of art to the fore. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. So when was it that you started this business? 2014, maybe 2013 at the very end. So it's still in its infancy and it has gone through a lot of transformation since the beginning. When I started, 
I thought that I was going to be more or less an elevated tour company. Mm -hmm. And then I came across some pretty interesting ideological issues. And the biggest among them is that some artists would say to me, well, if I'm sharing information with you and then you're getting paid giving that information on a tour, then I should get a cut. Mm. And there's a really, really big issue that unfortunately is incredibly prevalent among street artists specifically that they're constantly being exploited by corporations, by individuals, and it's terrible. It's actually pretty disgusting in a lot of cases that I've seen recently. And that was the criticism that this artist had, was that it was exploitative for me to make money off of information that I had been given. And I really thought about that, and I let that marinate. And I actually disagree, because to me... If I pay an artist a percentage of whatever it is that I've earned, then to me, that kind of delegitimizes the objectivity of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And if I talk about one person for five minutes, do they get more or less than if I talk about another person for three? And it just seemed really confusing. But the largest reason why I disagree is because I see these tours as an extension of what it was that I was doing in the classroom. And I teach contemporary art. So if I'm talking about Jasper Johns, I'm not cutting him a check for part of that day's lecture fee. And so when I was giving a tour, it wasn't a commercial exchange in my mind. Mm. It wasn't a, oh, I'm free on Saturday at 11. Take this tour where I read off Wikipedia information. It was something different, something more substantial. And so it just didn't feel right to me to engage in that kind of cost breakdown However, it also seems like a really big pain in the butt to have to communicate that again and again. And so I just decided that maybe giving tours isn't really the avenue that I wanted to explore. And I'll still give them. When you come to visit me in L.A., I will happily (laughs) give you a tour. But I don't do it for profit unless it's a class that I'm teaching and it involves some kind of outdoor adventure. So initially, I thought it was going to be that. And then it's really turned into a focus on the free digital archive that I've created. At this point, I've interviewed about 160 street artists and graffiti writers, and I'm trying to make something that lasts because the basic tenet of street art is its ephemerality. And it's important to me to create something that's permanent out of something that's not. So... That has been a really important aspect for me. And all of those interviews, the artists, they donate their time. The interview is free for viewers. And that's the altruism part. And recently, I've gotten into doing managerial curation for businesses. So if a business has a wall and an interest in getting that wall painted, often will come to someone like me who has access to the artist, but also access to a more mainstream vocabulary. So I do work like that. As you said, I started a podcast with an incredibly talented painter named Justin Bua, Mm -hmm. and it's called Art Attack. And that has been such a fun adventure where we just discuss contemporary and historical art themes. And what I love about working with Bua is that he knows so much about art history And that, unfortunately, is not all that common with a lot of the street artists and graffiti writers that I know. So we have a whole host of topics that we can really engage in. And that's been great. And I'm writing this book that is a new type of methodology. I think traditional art history so often emphasizes the distance between the writer and the subject. And that illusionism of objectivity, to me, is always wrong. I think art is the most objective form of information gathering and receiving that there is. And so I would be lying if I said that I felt objectively about this stuff. I'm only going to feel that way if it's not particularly moving. And something that I have that is unique is that I'm friends with all of these people, or I have relationships with them And I wanted to create a book and to forge a methodology that really reflected this and felt more appropriate to the genre. So it is half art historical tethering and half insider access to the artist and kind of a a mashup of those two. 
And it's going to be published by a gallery called 212 in New York, and it should be out in the fall. But that's just been so much fun, too. Wow, that's awesome. So it's really, you know, you've really been able to bring together all of your different talents and experiences, your art history background, your teaching experience, even your experience as an author. It's pretty incredible to see how everything is coming together under Art and Seeking. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it feels really good. And as I just mentioned, you have experience as an author from earlier in your life. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So my grandfather was a novelist and my mother is a novelist. And that genre of storytelling has always been really ingrained in my family. And when I grew up, I always thought that I was going to be an author too. And I wrote a book when I was 16. I think it's still on Amazon. I'm pretty sure two people have bought this book, maybe my mother twice. So it's not exactly a a big thing, but it helped me get into college. And what I learned through that experience is that I could never be an author in a way that my mother is and my grandfather was because it just felt so isolating. I was trapped by my desk and I felt confined and I wanted to be out in the world. And this type of writing has been the opposite experience. I get to interview people, have adventures with the artists, and it really seems like a way that I can both honor my family's legacy and also honor the differences that I've seen in myself and how I like to communicate. Yeah, wow, that's great. And so tell me a little more about what art and seeking looks like today. Like you mentioned working more closely with businesses and artists. I don't know if you have typical customers or typical types of people that you work with and tell me how you uh, work together with them. The deliciousness of that is that I don't have any particular type of person that I work with. It can be a corporation. It can be an individual who wants to be a patron of the arts, but doesn't really know how to get involved. So the diversity really appeals to me. And that has been a lot, a lot of fun because I get to introduce art enthusiasts to a different kind of world. And I guess a recent example of that, and this was a very personally significant example for me, is that I was able to give an art tour to my dad's law firm. He is a mergers and acquisitions attorney and probably... If I'm getting real deep and psychological with this, I bet he is the reason why I decided to go to grad school in the first place, because I've always been so desperate for his approval. And growing up, my brother was the smart one. I was the sweet one. And so I was always just anxious to switch that narrative and to be seen for my intellect. And when I dropped out of school, I thought, all right, well, that's it. I'm never going to get his approval now. But I can't sustain where I'm at, so I just have to sacrifice this. And of course, isn't this the way life goes? As soon as I didn't need his approval, and as soon as I found my happiness on my own, that's when he approved and validated me more than I ever have have been by him in my life. And the fact that we turned our relationship and our ability to self-accept and to accept the other person to such an extent that he asked me to give a tour to all of his partners and uh, the new lawyers who were just doing a summer internship program. That meant so much to me. And that, I think, was the highlight of my art and seeking experience is just being able to share that with my dad. And he would be one end of the spectrum and then somebody else, like a business owner of a really disruptive type of business in El Segundo, wanting some kind of cool, seductive art on their walls, that would be another. Or even just friends or people who are interested in expanding their personal art collection, I would help with that too. So there has been a nice range. And another example, the composer and the writer of Avenue Q, Mm -hmm. he found out about Art and Seeking and he wanted to do a mural for the 10th anniversary of the musical. And I thought that that would be a lot of fun. And it's so hard to get walls, even though there is never going to be a shortage. It's such a difficult process. There is a permit that you could get, but most people don't. So Mm -hmm. it ended up being kind of complicated. And so we decided to do a renegade stencil instead. And this artist, he did a little outline of Trekkie Monster from Avenue Q and spray painted it all over the city. And just like that Paige Smith geode that I found outside of spin class, this work didn't have a signature. And I thought that that was so lovely because it really, to me, reflects the generosity of the movement. That once the work 
once the paint dries, it's not yours anymore. And it's something that you are offering. It's something that you're giving. And to me, I guess generous would just be the best word. It, it feels so sincere and disentangled from the myopic business art world. And especially since I came from Christie's, that's a world that I know well, and that's a world that I'd like to avoid. And so any artist who does something for the goodness of the message or the project without equally desiring the recognition of their own craft, I think is so special. So doing that little Avenue Q project was really fun. And for whatever reason, I think that this artist just chose great locations, but they're still riding. And that's a street art term for you, Carolyn, riding. And (laughs) that means that the work is still up. And oftentimes the city will apply this hideous silver buff paint and get rid of the art because it is technically illegal. Right. But it is so much more aesthetically pleasing and contextually interesting than the hideous silver. So I think that that's another dialogue that street art engages that traditional art doesn't is the efficacy of the practice, but also who owns space and what's permissible and what's not and why. And it isn't just about the work, but it's about these larger discourses that the work really activates. Wow. Yeah. And your your statement, once the paint dries or once the ink dries, it's not yours anymore. It's really interesting. It's really kind of contributing to the space and the environment. Yeah. So many different things to think about. So many questions that art <laughs> raises, you know, it's just really interesting. Oh, it is. And the water is so muddy because that statement that I just made a lot of artists do not agree. Oh, yeah. So there are cases all the time when artists are suing corporations and it is tricky. There are lots of slippages because let's say you put up a work illegally on a building and you never got permission. And then once the paint dries, you scoot away, you're not arrested. So everything is awesome. Mm. So let's say that corporation decides to use your work in order to sell their product then you technically could sue them because it's a breach of copyright. Mm. But who owns that work now? Right. And if you never got permission in the first place, should you? But on the other hand, should the corporation benefit from work that wasn't theirs? So it is really, really tricky. It's, I think, impossible to license work that's in a public space when it's done in this renegade fashion. So you're right. I think the fact that there are so many questions raised that is the meatiest, most toothsome element to this whole world. Yeah. It's like the wild, wild west. There are no answers. It's fascinating. Right. You know, I see a parallel with like new technologies as well, like even things like blockchain and data collection and data privacy. It's like a lot of the laws and then the rules haven't caught up to them. And it's like, oh, what do we do? Well, as you said, the water's muddy. So people are still figuring all that out. Yeah. And it's been really fun to be a part of because there's the precedent is getting set now. And there are currently a couple of art cases in the legal pipeline, and we'll see what happens with those. But I don't know if you saw, but in New York, there was this big issue with the Five Points graffiti. And these graffiti artists, they ended up getting paid, or it was a settlement of $6.7 million, which is the first time ever that graffiti writing was recognized to this degree and legitimized with this kind of financial payback. And that's happened a couple of other times under this VARA Act, but that was with street art. And street art is very different aesthetically from graffiti. And it's awesome. This conversation is getting nuanced and people are starting to see value and merit and even aesthetic intrigue in a multiplicity of art forms and not just something that's a beautiful female face on a wall, which everybody can enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that there was actually a settlement in favor of the street artist, because I would think, you know, just initially, well, like, why would the street artist want to come out and out themselves as the artist since they've done something that's technically illegal? Like, wouldn't they be worried about getting in trouble or anything like that? Or I guess it doesn't really sound like it works that way. Totally. But that's a, a big issue, too, is that do you want to claim work that was done without permission And if you do, are you making yourself vulnerable for some kind of countersuit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really fun. I've got it. Well, I'm such a glutton for school. So maybe I'll go back and get a law degree so I I can be relevant in other ways. (laughs) At this point, I'm just philosophically interested. But 
that could be how Art and Seeking expands. But today, my focus is in the archive. It's in giving artists any sort of managerial support when they communicate with businesses, because often that can be a really an intimidating exchange and something that I have that I hope is seen as an asset for them is that I do have this traditional background. And so I kind of have a foot in both doors. I have one in the mainstream and then one in the margins. And I'm able to sort of bridge that gap, like you said. And that, I think, is the niche that Art and Seeking is meeting. Yeah, no, that makes sense to kind of look at what audience and and what purpose you're serving now and where you could evolve into the future. Are there any really memorable experiences that you've had with either an artist or a business as part of Art and Seeking that you'd like to share? There are so many. You've (laughs) got to come out here and we'll have some of these adventures together. But (laughs) there was one, definitely the most memorable interview I've done to date. And I would argue will be the most memorable interview I'll ever have, Mm -hmm. have experienced. But there is an artist. He goes by Punk Me Tender. And I ran into one of his works. It's not quite a painting. It's not quite a sculpture. And I was just transfixed by the elegance of the design. So it was a silhouette of a woman on a wall. So that part was two-dimensional. And then he had three-dimensional sculptural additions. So there was actual fabric that was representing the skirt and her garment. And I thought that that was just so clever and really aligned with my aesthetics. And I had to interview this guy. So I am a completely nerdy academic. Mm -hmm. And my bedtime is, I don't know, 9 (laughs) p.m. And typically, I'll do my interviews at 11 a.m. Sometimes my mom comes with me because she is the most supportive person in the world. Mm -hmm. And she wants to meet these guys. And it's so funny. And it's so precious. Her natural interest in art is more like Bateau. And Mm. for her to be going on all of these really crazy interviews with me, with these artists who have face tattoos. It's just, it's adorable that she's become so supportive. But anyway, (laughs) so I got in touch with Punk Me Tender and he said that I should meet him at this random gas station at 11 at night. So already we're way past my bedtime and I show up. I'm a little bit anxious. So I brought a friend with me to be my heavy And I got into this unmarked car and it was his cameraman. And at the time we have this really big Canyon, it's called Runyon Canyon. And a lot of people go hiking there. And at the time it was closed. Mm -hmm. So we parked the car and then I had to scale the fence (laughs) and trespass into Runyon. And I'm nervously chattering. I I can't see anything. (laughs) I'm stumbling right and left. I have no idea what to expect. And maybe a half an hour later, I finally get to the top of Runyon and there was a nude female model wearing a tutu, holding a chihuahua. And she had these sunglasses (laughs) that had been dipped in pink paint and that paint was dripping down her face. And Mm. she was the only person that was up there. Mm. And I was like, "Uh, are you punk me tender? (laughs) (laughs) And I've interviewed a ton of anonymous artists before. And typically what will happen is that We'll talk like human beings for a second, and then they put on their little bandana or whatever it is, and then we do the interview with the mask on or some sort of way to obscure the identity. But with this interview, I never met Punk Me Tender. There was some kind of microphone, I guess, between his mouth and her ear, and so it was like a game of interview telephone. I would ask the nude model the question. He would hear it. He would whisper back the response through the microphone, and then she would answer that back to me. And it was like I was part of this crazy performance piece, and I really appreciated that the artist respects what I'm doing enough to concoct this elaborate performance. (laughs) That was super fun. But the part that was harder for me is that typically I'll gauge how the question is landing looking at the person's face. Yeah. And and I couldn't do that. And so, of course, my questions were terrible. They were like, why do you use the color pink? <laughs> and each of my interviews will have maybe 10 views. I mean, I don't know. And this one has thousands and thousands. Yeah. So wow. that was, it was a really fun experience and just, again, asserts the diversity in the field. And there's room for all of it. And it is just such a privilege to be this nerdy academic who gets to be involved. 
It's incredible. That artist was incredibly method. It kind of reminds me of like an Andy Kaufman <laughs> comedian performance where it's like, what is this you or is this somebody else? What is this? Oh, that's pretty oh my cool. God, totally. That is, is a perfect reference. And I only knew that the interview was over when the nude model said to me, thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm like, how do I get down? <laughs> so that was, that was a crazy one. And wow. then for this book that I'm writing, I, I want to have some kind of experience that is unique to the artist for each feature. And there's this one artist, he goes by Balloonski, and he is a very good friend of mine. And he has such an interesting and non-traditional material choice he uses balloons in his art, which I think is just such a sophisticated way of honoring the ephemerality of the field because nothing is more ephemeral than a balloon. And it's so playful. And if you think about when you typically encounter balloons, mm -hmm. it's at a birthday party or some sort of celebration. And so he's turning the act of crossing the street into an event that's worthy of commemoration. And so he's just such a joyful artist and drugs are actually really integral to his practice. And mm. I figured, ah, oh, I can't write about Balloonski without doing drugs. Ugh. And I haven't done any drugs. So that was also another adventure is that he and I had a little mushroom oh my gosh. afternoon. And now, now I know. Wow. <laughs> so those would be the two that really stick out in my mind. Talking to a naked woman <laughs> as a game of interview telephone <laughs> and doing drugs with Balloonski. Oh, gee. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, the definitely. Met would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Tell me a little bit about, like, say the biggest challenge you faced in either launching the business or, or running it. And how is it something that you either address or overcome? There have been a lot of surprising challenges. I would say the first and the most significant was developing trust with the artist. Because as I said, these guys are exploited and unfairly treated all the time. Mm -hmm. And street art is a very hot topic right now. And that's not why I'm interested in it, but that's why a lot of hobbyist enthusiasts are. And I needed to really give it time to prove myself and to show, hey, I'm in this because I see the merit in what you're doing. And I see the merit in the collective experience of this renegade practice. And that is something that I couldn't, I didn't anticipate that it was going to take that long, but I'm glad that I gave it the time because these relationships are solid because the foundation is authentic. And I really hope that people trust me and I certainly trust them and the artists that I have special relationships with. So that, that was a challenge, but I think it was a necessary one because it's the long game and it's not necessarily what can I do after jumping in on the scene two seconds ago? Mm. It's like, calm down yeah. and prove yourself. And that's, that's a very graffiti mentality, I think, is just, okay, so how long have you been on the streets? And I feel like I've kind of had to go through that same hazing process, if yeah. you will. And it's been incredibly rewarding. And another challenge, and this is an internalized one, it has nothing to do with any of the artists that I work with, but I think... This is a particularly female experience, this idea that we're imposters. And it's very hard for me to charge for work that I do. Mm. When I remember when I gave tours and people would say, well, how much do you charge? And I would just shudder and want to walk away mm -hmm. and just not do it at all. It's so hard to give yourself some kind of financial tether to the work that you do and sometimes I am taken advantage of, but I allow that to happen. So that's on me. And I would never show up to a dinner with an artist with a canvas and say, hey, buddy, can you paint this for me? Mm. And sometimes I'm asked, oh, can you just edit this or can you just write this without realizing that that is my creativity and that's what it is that I'm able to offer. But again, that's not the fault of the artist or the person asking. It's the fault entirely of, of it's my fault. And that challenge is something that I'm still trying to work on. And it's really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that one, I don't quite know how it's going to be resolved, but I think awareness is something. And looking backwards a little bit and recognizing what has happened already and what's been accomplished rather than just looking anxiously and yearningly ahead at all of the things that I have yet to do. So 
that's what I'm working on currently. But definitely the one that's in the rear view mirror is the trust that I hope that I've established. Yeah. No, that's great. You know, as you said, you kind of have to establish that street cred and that totally makes yeah, sense. Exactly. You know, everybody else. <laughs> and I think the challenge of being nervous or anxious about putting a specific value or asking for payment for your creative work, when I feel like artists and anyone in the creative arts, whether it's writers, designers, really get that expectation that they'll work for free or work for exposure, like whatever that means. So, so there's yeah. that, that layer plus, and I agree that I think, you know, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen to men, but I think especially with women, we tend to feel like, you know, nervous about asserting and saying, no, this is what I want. And this is what my work is worth and charging that way. And I think it seems like from the people I've talked to and the stuff I've read, it probably just comes with time. You get more and more confidence, just knowing how to value yourself. Yeah, I think you're right. And certainly when I started teaching, I felt like the biggest fraud in the world. How did I bamboozle all of these students into thinking that I know anything about anything. And I still feel that way a little bit in the form of nerves because I put a lot of pressure on myself and I realized that for some of these students, this is going to be their only contact with art. And so I want to make it good. And if they're only going to listen to one hour on colonial portraiture, Mm -hmm. then I owe it to Copley to make that hour the most entertaining one and the most fulfilling one that I possibly can. Mm -hmm. So I think my imposter syndrome has turned into a way to appropriately celebrate the work that's behind me. And that only happened in time because I've been teaching college for 12 years. So I still feel a little bit like an imposter because I always want to be better. I could always know more. And I always hope that searching will be a part of my personality and my process. But At this point, I know that I'm not a fraud. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. that's good. That's been a happy realization. Yeah, that's definitely good. And I think, again, a lot of people do struggle with that imposter syndrome, even people who outwardly look very successful. So um, moving forward from that is a, a big achievement. So in your business now, what would you say are the biggest talents or, or most important skills that you're using now to grow and run your business? I would say... Tenacity. Mm. That is really important. That is an integral characteristic of my personality. And that tenacity and just that desire to ask and then ask again, because street artists in particular are very difficult to pin down. And if you take that one no as the final answer, then nothing's ever going to get done. So Mm. the reason why I'm able to accomplish anything is because I have a really good work attitude. And I don't even see it as work really. And I know that that's so hackneyed to say, but I could work for 24 hours straight because to me, it is so fun. I feel like I am tricking, talk about an imposter. I do feel like I'm sort of tricking the world because this does not feel like work and I don't get paid very often. So that is one (laughs) element of the business that I do hope picks up a little. But when I do, it just feels like this incredible gift. How did this happen? I was just playing. And I think that attitude is a skill that really works in my favor because I love this. I love this art. I love getting to talk about it. And it all just feels like such a joyful exchange. When I go over to Justin Bua's to record this podcast, I am so giddy on this interminable drive because We get to talk about art for a half an hour. And that's how I feel when I teach. It's the luckiest job. I cannot even imagine that I lucked out enough where I get to do it, that I get to talk about my ideas and my interests and things that matter to me, and I get to get paid. (laughs) So that skill, that skill of enthusiasm and of love and of tenacity, that's my arsenal. That's awesome. And so I guess looking forward, you alluded to this a little bit in your last answer, but what are your goals for art and seeking? Kind of where do you want to see it move in the next couple of years or so? I am super into this podcast, and I hope that that turns into something bigger because it's a way to get that lecture content out of the classroom and into the world. And even when I do work in street art, it's still just as ephemeral as the art on the walls because once that conversation is over, it's gone. And with this, it's a nice way to memorialize something forever. And it's, it's there. And that has been a really exciting opportunity. So I hope that that continues. I hope that I get to continue writing books 
And this book that I'm doing currently, the focal point is Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the next one can be New York or maybe even an international city. And I could go to Sao Paulo and talk about the art there. So I think that there is limitless content. And I hope that the way that I evolve is to just encompass all of those different cities and all of those different scenes. And eventually the street art bubble is going to pop. And this happens in art in every format. That's something that is really attractive, that's really mainstream, like street art is becoming, eventually gets forgotten and trickles out to the margins. And then there's another surge of interest. And then it cycles back to the middle. And we've already seen that happen with street art from its initial renaissance in the 1970s and 80s with writers like Basquiat or people who are working in a public space like Keith Haring Mm -hmm. on the the sides of subway cars and in the station. And so then it kind of died down. And then with Banksy, and especially with his documentary Exit Through the Gift Shop, now it's the the sexy topic again. Mm. And so when it fades away, I hope that Art and Seeking can accommodate that shift and maybe do something cutting edge with the next art trend. And that's the beauty of art history is that you can apply the past and you can apply your skills and visual acuity to any form of art that's interesting. And I'm particularly passionate in art that engages larger discourses, but that's not limited to street art or graffiti. And I see that that's already starting to take shape in a new direction And that, I think, will be reflected, too, in the type of work that I do in the future. Ah, that's awesome. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about art and seeking? Well, I'm on all the social media platforms. (laughs) I can be found on Instagram. Everything is art and seeking and art attack, the podcast and my email. It's Lizzie, L-I-Z-Y, at artandseeking.com. Okay, perfect. And thank you again for having me. I really... I have loved you for years and I love this new adventure that you're tackling. And I think that you're doing really important work and it's just an honor to be a part of it. Oh, thank you. Well, it's really an honor to have you on the podcast to share your story. It's really fascinating to be able to follow your journey. We've known each other for a while and I've known bits and pieces as I've watched you go through it, but it's really great to hear the full story and hear what you're doing now. So thank you. Thanks for listening to the Beyond Six Seconds podcast. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player so you won't miss any episodes. You can also find all the show notes and links we discussed in this episode at our website, www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.